Welcome to another episode of the Trusted Advisor podcast and video series powered by the Retail Solutions Providers Association. Our goal on the pod is to accelerate the success of today's and tomorrow's leaders in the retail IT industry. I'm Jim Roddy back with you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's a special episode where we're talking with somebody outside of the RSP membership community. This is only the second time we've done that in 80 episodes, but after I introduce our guest, you'll understand why. Ron Thurston is a retail executive, board advisor, and author with extensive experience leading retail operations for some of America's most prominent brands, including Apple, West Elm, St. Laurent, Bonobos, and Tory Birch, plus several retail tech startups. He's been especially busy the past two years as well. So first, look at, listen to this. He was named a top retail influencer by Rethink Retail. He published his book, Retail Pride, which I have a copy of right here. He launched his audio and video platforms for a year-long tour called Retail in America. And when you want to talk about going all in on a tour, that's what Ron's doing. He's driving across the country, across the United States, living in and recording in an Airstream trailer to discover unsung retail heroes. Ron, welcome to the pod. How are you and where are you? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I am currently in Petaluma, California. Uh, in kind of the, the Napa Valley area. And, you know, I'm from Northern California, so it's particularly special to me to be back and, you know, and be in the Airstream. And I saw my family this weekend while we're, while we're here, and it's just been a joy. You know, I've left New York City six months ago, so to be in California and to see, and, you know, meeting with a, a founder um, for my own podcast this week, and there's just, a, there's a lot um, there's a lot happening in retail, and I'm happy to be on the front lines, just hearing, seeing, and, and discovering what's great about our industry, which is so much. Wonderful. And for our audience uh, listener, uh, listening and watching on YouTube, can you tell us, is that background, is that one of those fake ones you had dropped in, or is that uh, is that real with the trees and, and the sky and everything? This is the real deal. I'm sitting um, in, in the Airstream. The backdrop is actually... There's a whole farm of cows next to me. <laughs> so this is definitely not New York City anymore on a foggy, you know, California morning, as you would expect. Beautiful. I love it. Fabulous. Well, before yeah. we get in talking about what you've discovered, I mentioned in your intro about you're involved in uh, retail tech startups. Can you give a little bit of more background uh, in that? Because our audience, again, is, you know, retail tech community. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So I'll, I'll mention first, um, in part of the... I think the goal of the tour was to make sure that as many people as possible, specifically frontline teams, uh, really heard about this and the, the idea that there is really an advocate uh, for their work that they do and the careers that they have and, and utilizing my book as the platform, which you so generously showcased there. And which is, by the way, two years old tomorrow. So it's about to have a two year birthday and it's, um, been really my greatest joy of my career to be able to showcase great people doing work on the front lines. But there are two retail technology brands that have been highly involved in this tour. One is KWI, which is a 35 year old plus um, POS and Omni solution for specialty retailers. And the other is Ubic, uh, which is a training and communication platform that is in used in 80 countries and 300 brands in retail and hospitality. And you know, those two things together, when I think about um, great retail experiences for both the internal customer and the external customer, you need, of course, great POS solutions and whatever that looks like for your brand, um, whether that be you know, through an iPad, through traditional POS, through RFID, whatever that looks like for your brand, POS is an important part of the experience, um, but so is communication with the team. And you know, retail traditionally has not been one that adopted quickly new field communication tools. There's still a lot of, of you could use Slack, there's a lot of email, there's a lot of text messaging, WhatsApp. So you it takes all of that and puts it together and says, Every employee can access micro training and all the corporate communication, everything they need right in one place on their phone. Uh, and so I'm a big fan of their solution and what they're using. Uh, but I'm also involved with some retail tech startups. One is called Reflex, which is about retail workforce on demand. They're currently in pilot in Texas and they 
um, have are building this kind of ecosystem of people they call reflexors who are you know on the platform that are available to work and then brands uh, that can um, maybe they have an open shift or maybe they have a high workload over a particular weekend or they have someone on vacation they can community to to call in reflexors and come in and fill in some of that work and that's uh, not been done at scale in, in specialty retail and so i'm helping them there's a company called immerse based out of dallas that is doing live selling um, and clienteling i'm highly involved there so there's you know i every point of the journey in retail requires great technology it requires great people first which is mm -hmm. always my first priority but it requires great technology whether that's how you communicate internally how you communicate to the customer how you integrate information into the, the experience how you engage in every part of our business and um, that requires a lot of effort and, and a lot of great solutions Got it. Well, thank you for that. And I guess it also shows folks that on this tour, you're not like just on vacation, right? Just hanging out. Uh, no. You're busy working out of that air, uh, out of that airstream. So let's talk a little bit more about the tour itself. So you and I had talked earlier this year before you began your trek. I remember we talked like shortly before you were about to uh, leave New York yep. City. And we were introduced by a mutual friend of ours, Tracy Landy uh, from Vault, who's an, an RSP member. So I, I'm I'm up to speed with your plans. I've been following you, you know, from a, a social media. And, and your newsletter standpoint, but can you share with our li listeners so they understand like what exactly are you doing? Why are you on the road? And then if you can also talk about everywhere you've traveled between New York uh, and California to this <laughs> point, if you can. It's a long list, Jim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to do it off the top of my head. Uh, so my, I'll I'll just back up for those that don't know. To, uh, having spent you know three plus decades leading stores and that was everything that was field-based so sales i was a store manager i was a district manager i was a regional i worked in corporate visual merchandising for gap um, and went on to help launch brands like west elm um, i ran apple stores um, i helped launch bonobos when i moved to new york city eight years ago and running saint laurent and then most recently um, as the vice president of stores for Intermix, which is a Gap owned un until last year, a Gap owned brand. And you know, this idea of field leadership and how we um, engage, how we think about our careers, how we um, really. I wrote Retail Pride. Uh, and then the tour really became this idea of how can we take. Uh, this message and go out on the road and find these stories. And what's interesting about retail, I think, is that those stories, when you work in our business, are so generously told internally. And so for me, as a head of stores, I would travel the country, I would visit, I would take teams out to dinner, and I would hear all these incredible stories about their customers and their how they work together as a team and what it really takes to to run a store. You know, it takes an incredible skill set to be a store manager, one that I don't think is as recognized um, as broadly as it should. And I said, my husband and I both said, you know, could we leave New York City, buy an Airstream, and go out and find these stories? And what would that look like? Should it be a podcast? Could it be a second book? Could it be um, events and networking opportunities? And like everywhere we've gone, it's like, how do we make the most of learning what that community is about and learning what's successful um, and what kind of where maybe some new brands have started and what's just, what's the real story that, that's happening in retail? And as you mentioned earlier, like find those retail heroes. And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, and so there was a bit of a delay in the Airstream and we were already you know, kind of leaving New York. So we did spend time in Florida, um, had some time in Miami, Orlando, um, Boston, and then the Airstream arrived May 1st. And so that's when it was Asheville. Uh, and I, I could go on for hours about each of these cities and the people that I met, but Asheville, Nashville, um, through like Memphis and 
I'm losing Isn't... Dallas, Austin. Um, and then you know, the, the summer was really about, so that was through June. Mm -hmm. And then we made it through like um, Angel Fire, New Mexico, uh, Park City in Utah, um, several cities in Montana, uh, and just in Denver, Colorado. We spent three weeks camping at the base of the Rocky Mountains in Denver. And you know, every city has been this, this unique stories. But I would say the other important part here is in the country is so incredibly beautiful. And if you really have not had that opportunity to spend time in our national parks and to, you know, other than what I always did was fly around, visit cities, all work related, but didn't spend a lot of time. I've never lived, you know, this kind of RV life. Yeah. And, you know, that is something that I think is, um, I, as an unexpected in many ways kind of perk is you know, exploring nature and seeing mm -hmm. how beautiful this country is and meeting, you know, the RV life is about new neighbors every day. People, yeah. you know, right behind me here, as you see, there's an empty space. Someone will arrive today from somewhere. And so you, you're in this constant state of meeting new people yeah. from all different political views and religious views. And uh, that is what I think great um, human connection is about, like have it, finding common ground with strangers. Right. And that's really what retail is all about as well. It's not just moving goods. It's really that sense of community uh, that it can bring and, and that, that connectivity. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's been, you know, there, there are many, I think, unexpected benefits, but that's one of, you know, what is, what's the real story of um, how we engage with each other? And then how does that play into retail? Yeah. And you know, when you, there's so much conversation about so much news about retail, but I love being the one that's, well, actually this mm -hmm. is how it, how it looks and feels. And, you know, I like to sit in that spot today. Well, and I was also glad to hear that this was part of your husband's idea as well. I don't know if it was announced like, Hey, guess what I'm doing or guess what we're doing for the next year. So glad he was in no. on it. <laughs> and you know, you live in 180 square feet and you're yeah. <laughs> you know, very, you spend every day, all day together. I think that is um, a, another huge benefit. Good. I was going to say, when you go on a road trip with someone, you don't come out of it neutral. You either like them better, you like them worse and vice versa. There's a, you don't come out feeling exactly the same uh, at the a, end. Absolutely so. true, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, and so and so let's talk about from a technology standpoint, you touched earlier on, right? The audience for this podcast is technology solution providers serving retail, hospitality, grocery. We also have folks, you know, serving cannabis dispensaries. So what are the biggest lessons that you've learned during your trip, you know, about from a technology standpoint that you'd want to share with this audience? What do you think, to, you know, if you had to speak uh, in front of them at a trade show, but we're doing this virtually now because we're you're in your own yeah. platform right now? Yeah. I, I would say anything you can do that engages the frontline teams in a way that benefits their current role, future roles that they have, career development, um, building their business, um, supporting work is where I think there are brands that are winning. And I would say to answer your question, it's the biggest opportunity because there are uh, the scale of how that operates from you know, the highest end of luxury to Dollar General is widely um, variant. And so what I mean by that is you know, there, are, there are store teams who uh, don't have all the necessary tools, don't have updated POS solutions, don't have great communication tools. Um, and there are brands that are finding ways to do that incredibly well. And so when we back out and say, nothing happens in our business without people, because mm -hmm. that's true that there are, you all, we have, other than Amazon Go, this is not a self-service business. Everything mm -hmm. requires people and requires leadership. And part of the challenge of hiring and retaining and that huge, very important conversation about workforce uh, is related to technology, I believe because brands that have great solutions that are highly engaged with their 
um, with their stored frontline teams um, can retain those teams at a greater pace than others that don't because they're looking for ways to um, build a business, like I said, engage and learn and grow and stay connected. And that's where some of these solutions come into play. I think there are other great, you know, RFID is certainly an important component here of how brands are managing inventory and thinking about replenishment systems. Um, there are you know, incredible ways to think about who's coming into your store, what are the, what's their profile, how many people walk by. You know, I, I hear and I learn about all of these, but I always think first about what is the experience of the team working in the store? How does this benefit them? And how does that create um, a better employee experience and therefore retaining them um, at a, a, a at a healthier in a healthier way, I should say. Yeah, so that's interesting that you're because a lot of folks are talking about customer experience. It's all about the customer experience, but you're talking about it from the employee experience. Like that is the predominant area do you think technology solution providers should focus? And why is that? Is it because the more tenured employees are the ones who are going to provide a better, you know, better advice? They're more of a trusted advisor than just somebody there who's who's ringing you up. Uh, does it go on that? Because I've always said nobody's ever written a successful story like we built our business turning over employees at a high rate. Is it all coming down to that? Is that the foundation of it? I guess if you can dive a little deeper into why employee yeah. experience is so important. Yeah, great great follow-up, Jim. I, I absolutely agree that we have to put that employee experience first. I do. Because the, the customer experience, you know, if that's the, the first um, expectation, but the employee is not as is not engaged, is not um, using the technology, is not creating an environment that supports a great customer experience, then you will fail. And so I, I think about that in terms of you know, brands that spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, luxury brands on a window and the execution of a beautiful visual display um, or a store design. The, but what the customer remembers, that may bring them into the store, but what the customer remembers is the first person they engage with. What happens? What is, what's the technology that they're using to engage but what's the employee experience using that technology? And if they are fully invested in everything that the brand stands for, what, and then has a story to tell. So when I think about this, so you've spent all this money on this window and, the, and then the customer walks in because they're so inspired. And the first person they meet says, wow, I saw that you, that you noticed our window. Let me tell you a little bit about the story behind that. Let me mm -hmm. tell you more about our creative director. Let me tell you um, why those colors are important. I mean, there's a, there are a million points that you could story tell from, but that even if you didn't buy anything, you will remember that conversation because you learned something about the brand and that may inspire you for a future visit. You may tell your friends and family of like, oh, I visited this brand and I met this guy, Ron, and he told me all about the stories. Um, of what's happening with the brand today. That is what you remember. And the technology is meant to just support that employee experience. Uh, but if on the reverse, if none of that happened and mm -hmm. you walk in and had no, no engagement, then your ability to storytell after your visit, I believe is very limited. You may think it's a pretty store mm -hmm. or you may have said, Oh, the people seemed nice, but you don't have a story to tell. And that, I think that's the where power really puts that frontline team, that store team and the leaders of those teams as the primary audience for every solution. Got it. It's interesting you say that as you describe that story. I remember being in the Pittsburgh area. So I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. James Connors from Erie. He got drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I don't buy jerseys, you know, all the time. In fact, like almost never. But I'm like, I would buy a James Conner jersey. I go into this store and there are two associates there. And I was in the store for three, four minutes looking around, like clearly wanting something. And they just stood the whole time at the counter and griped 
about something unrelated. Nobody's even said welcome or how can I help you or something like that. So what you're saying yeah. resonates with me in terms of, and then let me also ask you this. So we did a podcast a while back. This was coming out of the pandemic about maximizing your labor and making sure you don't have that turnover. And the folks mm-hmm. that we talked with on there said, like even just having a solution that allows your employees to schedule their time off or see, you know, other schedules and things like that, as opposed to having mm-hmm. a call up their manager and things of that nature, having more integrated back-end solution, that's going to have them go, you know what, I might be able to go work somewhere else for a dollar more an hour, or it might be a little closer to my house. But boy, this is just an easier place to work. It's a way better experience than the headaches I have to put up with. Is that kind of what you're talking about, reducing the employee experience headaches and having it be more of a delight so those delightful, high-performing people want to stay uh, in that retail or in that restaurant? That's exactly right. Exactly right, Jim. And that's, I would say, one component you know, scheduling and flexible work mm-hmm. uh, is, I'd say, one component to a, a great employee experience, and there are others. Uh, but if that that piece alone, which is part of, you know, reference back reflex, this idea of, of like that people really want to work in retail. And you know, Ubik did a study um, of several thousand frontline employees this year um, and, and published this study um, that said, you know, over almost 60% of these people replied and said, I love working in retail and I plan on staying at least four more years. Mm. But the challenge is you know, that they weren't uh, receiving all the tools and resources and training necessary to do their job well. So there's this strange um, idea that we have around frontline workforce and hospitality workforce um, that they don't want to be here. And I say they actually love being here. They love this industry. They love to serve. They've chosen this industry for a reason, but we have to give them scheduling tools and flexible work and resources and all of it because they want to grow in their careers. That's our responsibility then as leaders to make that happen. I'm, I'm glad you said that the first advice I always give on hiring is raise the bar for the type of person you're hiring and how long you want them to stay. If you assume this person's only going to turn over every six months or a year or two years or something like that, well, then you're probably just going to hire somebody who's going to turn over every two years. Design your system, hold out for people who are going to be long-term and to be folks who can really, really lift your business. So, well, good. Well, thank you for that. I'm also hoping you can give some insights to our audience because again, they sell into retail. So bringing your experience before you hit the road and what you've seen on the road, how should our audience, audience? How should they approach retail prospects? How should they not approach those retail prospects? What are some of the pain points or opportunities they should be prepared to address in order to to help them make the sale? Yeah, I love this question, Jim, because uh, now on the advisory side, you know, both as as a head of stores for many years, but now on the advisory side, I get to sit in on a lot of those calls or I'll, you know, sometimes on Zoom and you know, it, it's funny because then they'll see someone like me and they're like, is that Ron Thurston? Like on the call, like to the, it's funny to be on that side of it. Yeah. And uh, so to answer your question, you know, this is an industry that is so rooted in relationships and that ha- there's such a deep understanding of um, why we do what we do, why we love it. Um, how we engage with each other. And it is very relationship built. And that's how jobs are, are found. That's how um, businesses are built. That's how investments are done. It's all very relationship heavy. But we have a very special and I would say unique language that we think about, you know, about how we serve. It's a, it's a unique um, industry and in how we think about all the different aspects of it from operations and back of house, front of house, sales, product, um, inventory management, sourcing. I mean, the there's it's so broad. Uh, and so the idea here of understanding the language, understand how business operates, um, understanding the challenges that retailers face every day, and that you have a solution to solve a problem but the problem is not the same in every business. And in fact, I would say it's not the same in every every part of the country for the same business. Hmm. And it may be as unique as this particular market has a specific challenge 
that you have a solution to solve. So I think it's asking, being very curious about questions. What's, what are your challenges? Um, what, where have you found great solutions and where are you still struggling? Um, and how can, how can what you are proposing solve that problem? And if you understand what their problems are, you're more equipped to go into the sales call with um, the language that solves that problem. Uh, and what I've experienced on the other side of the coin is don't assume that they have this problem, you know, ask first and mm -hmm. you know, dig into it before you um, talk about payroll or labor management or people or operations, like understand the challenge and then you can address the problem front on. Got it. Thank you for that. I'm a big fan of the the book and the whole concept of the challenger sale, where you shouldn't just be going in and pitching your product. You should be going in and teaching them something. So that requires you to, as either a business leader or as your sales team, that they've got to make sure they're researching the industry, right? They're asking a lot of questions. They're learning outside of the sales process. And then when they get into that sales process, asking, you know, bringing that knowledge to the table, but asking a whole bunch of questions as well, instead of just, well, here's my pitch here's what we do here's the you know xp 1000 and what it can bring to you that's kind of what you're sound what you're saying is you have to have a more sophisticated uh thinking and a more sophisticated approach and a more sophisticated sales process that's exactly right and i've read that book as well jim and um that it, it's exactly the approach is if you go into it telling them information that may not be accurate you've lost credibility because you're an outsider you're not from within. And yep. so I think that that's where it's where I've had success of like, I understand your problems because I've mm -hmm. done every role in the store. I understand what you need and I understand how your people are receiving this. But if you come in and you don't, you've never worked in retail and you think you're, you've got this great solution, but you don't actually know how it works, uh, that will go nowhere. And I've seen that happen. And the best salespeople in the world that have sold to you know, in other industries may not always be the best salesperson selling retail technology mm -hmm. because of that human, the human relationship and engagement side of it. I think it's, uh, I've learned a lot being on the other side of the table now of how this works. And it's, um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to, to watch um, how new solutions can be adopted, but then how they're, how the, the journey begins. Yeah, before we take a quick quick break, I'll just say, talking with a lot of our solution providers, the more successful salespeople are somebody who was a former restaurant manager with no sales experience that they bring on to talk work, or like you said, don't be an outsider. Those, yeah. those kind of folks get way more traction than somebody who looks like a million damn dollars, right? And the hair slicked back and the perfect suit and things like that. That is not, right? I mean, that might work in some industries, but really it's to be, I love that concept where you said it's not an, you've got to be in, perceived as an insider, not an outsider. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Jim. Great. So let's pause here to let our listeners and viewers know an RSP membership has never been more valuable or affordable. Annual memberships for VARS start at just $250 a year for dozens of high value services. That's just 68 cents a day. Also, vendors and software developers benefit from an RSP membership through introductions of RNISV members and by showcasing their solutions through the exclusive RSPA Solution Center. Also, we want to say thanks to our sponsors who support the RSP community and make this podcast and video series possible. Our platinum sponsor for 2022 is Blue Star. Our gold sponsors are Brother, Cocard, Heartland, Scant Source, and Shift4. To receive the benefits of an RSP membership or RSP sponsorship, email membership at gorspa.org. All right. So a few more questions for you before I want to say you get back on the road, but you, you get back out <laughs> checking out the cows uh, behind you. Um, can you talk in general about where do you see the future for brick and mortar stores? Like we hear so many different, you know, doomsday or nothing to worry about whatsoever. But it seems like they have a new role in, you know, as the world gets more digital uh, by the yeah. day. How, how do you view uh, the role of brick and mortar stores today and going forward? Oh, I love this because... I think it's actually never been more exciting. It's never been more interesting. It's never been more complex. 
it's never been more um, controversial. You know, all of it, all of it is so exciting. You know, there, there was very much a time not that long ago, you could say less than 10 years, where there was you know, a store strategy, an e-commerce strategy, maybe a social strategy, and they all functioned <clears throat> independently. You know, now we have to say every part of the ecosystem of our business is about um, a channelless world where it's all engaged. And I think because of um, this kind of ideas or challenges around customer acquisition, advertising, um, customer retention, all of it puts the store back at the front of the conversation. And there's a lot of reporting right now, you know, it's the highest number of store openings this country has seen, I think since 2019, mm -hmm. uh, the, the growth, the business in stores is, you know, up, and traffic above 2019 levels, you know, all the, the success and the importance of stores is greater than ever. Uh, yet we're facing, you know, a lot of challenges around labor, around cost, around supply chain, around, uh, <clears throat> you know, the customer retention and, for me, the, the best way to, to think about all of these is the store, because the statistics would say, you know, you, so you've got higher conversion rates in stores, whether that's, you know, under 10 or in, you know, 25 plus, you've got lower return rates, you have higher average spends, you've got you know, minimal shrink in most cases, depending on your business model, you've got a level of customer acquisition and retention that's higher than e-commerce. So you've got all, all the statistics and the math show brick and mortar as the most important channel. And by the way, still you know, 80 plus percent of revenue is still done in stores. Mm -hmm. And I was just listening to the, at the new CEO of Amazon on a podcast, you know, speaking about the importance of stores. And while their, their brick and mortar strategy has been somewhat inconsistent, you know, they open and then they close and they, they test and learn, you know, that's really what this is. Mm -hmm. it's a learn strategy. They, he himself said, you know, this is an 80% world, 80% brick and mortar world. And we have to honor and respect that. And, you know, of that 20, Amazon owns, you know, 40% of that. Great. But the store is how we connect as humans. It's how we build community. It's how we discover new brands. It's how we acquire customers. All of this is about the, the store. And that is not changing. You know, there was <laughs> certainly a moment in, in 2020 where, you know, even I was like, like, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm not, I, we, it was a very unpredictable time for all of us, but here we are in, in late 2022. And I could not be more excited about stores. And Interesting. people and customers and discovery that we crave this, we want this. And what I have seen exactly that on my tour, I've seen malls all over this country filled with traffic. I've seen um, you know, the level of engagement being really high. I've seen people very interested in working in this industry. And it just, sometimes that headline is not a valid you know, representation of what's happening, um, particularly the headlines on people. That's the one that, that really um, frustrates me because I find happy, pr proud people okay. everywhere I go, yeah. everywhere I go. And, Interesting. and that is it's so much fun. Yeah, that. well, you know, there's a disgruntled coworker, but there's no gruntled, right? No one ever talks about someone who's happy, right? That doesn't make the news uh, by it's any true. means because it's the, you know, the the outstanding. Uh, let me ask you this: so, like inside restaurants, a lot of folks are seeing, you know, smaller footprints from a seating standpoint, but larger kitchens mm -hmm. because there's more curbside, there's more, you know, DoorDash and everything like that. Is there anything going on inside those stores that you've been seeing that you're like, yeah, it's still a store, but here are some changes that are happening you know between the four walls that our audience you think could could take advantage of or should know about uh, especially if they want to be that trusted advisor yeah i would say the this kind of as i mentioned the sense of discovery of brands is a really important moment because what what happened 
when we were all spending more time shopping on e-commerce is that you're very overwhelmed by all of your choices. There's yes. limitless choices. And, and as a human, we really want to be able to say, what are, what are the three I get to choose from? You know, why, here are three. Tell me why I should have this one. And it's, it's really overwhelming, no matter what you're shopping for, to try to narrow that down. And so I think the, the store has become this place where the brand said, here are the three. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm going to fill it with great people who are going to tell you why we've picked these three and what's the one for you based on what I'm going to learn about you. And I'm going to ask you questions about what you need. And then I'm going to tell you and share what I, what my opinion would be. And that is I think, the best version of what's happening. So brands are smaller footprint for sure is what you're seeing. You're seeing, um, some of this shop and shop, new ideas, shorter term leases, um, things that are, you know, not the 15 year long term, I'm going to build um, this giant flagship and expect people to come. That's not what's happening. What's happening is it's fast and it's interesting and it's new and it's engaging. Uh, and a month from now, it could be something different. And to the customer is this constant or what's new, but what you have chosen as being the most important pieces of that. That's why people go to stores. Yeah. Interesting. And are you seeing this already in the SMB space? A lot of our, a lot of our audience sells into SMB. Do you see this filtering down or is this really only the biggest brands are doing these things right now? No, I'm seeing it very much filter down. I'm seeing it, um, you know, the SMB space is really the one that has the ability to do this first and to say, you know what, right yeah. now for the holiday season, we really stand for this, but for spring, we're going to do something different. And every time you think about your business model in a new way, it gives you a reason to contact your customer. And so this idea of newness all the time and change um, is such a positive way to build a business. It drives traffic, it drives conversion, it drives outreach. Um, it, and when you say it's only here for a limited time, it, it drives conversion. So there's all these benefits that would say, just as quickly as e-commerce and social drives new ideas, brick and mortar can do it the same way. And SMB has the ability. Um, you know, there's a pop-up business that's right now growing quickly in the UK called Souk, S-O-O-K. And they're building this model that would say, I'm going to open a pop-up for an hour or for a day or for a weekend. And their, their structure is um, the walls are all done with, with video screens okay. and there's a fle flexible fixture package. And you say, you know what, I'm going to open a pop-up this weekend for my new brand that you know, I want to launch. And I'm going to give, I give soup, my video, all the video content. And this is how I want the store to look. I show up and I run a pop-up, you know, and rent it for a weekend. That yeah. is great social content. It's a great way for brand recognition. It drives traffic. I, I see photographs from these souk um, pop-ups that are the lines go around the block for these because it's only for a weekend. Yep. So it's these kind of ideas of um, it's fresh and it's new and it's always evolving. Um, that's what's I think the exciting uh, an exciting moment in time of what's happening in stores. Yeah, and you're saying SMBs can make that decision quickly because it's not like there's some you know whole tree that they have to navigate of employees. Correct. I mean, I've seen depart several department stores we won't name names you know that are under renovation, and I'll say, well, it, it, it's clearly under renovation, and I'll say, well, what's what's happening here? What's going on? Oh, you know, the store we're, we're moving floors and we're changing our business. And well, how long is the renovation? Oh, it's until you know fall 2023. I'm like that. Yeah, that for me, that as a customer, you know, I'm like, well, I guess I'll come back in a year when the store looks <laughs> right. like it's done. Like that's not be nimble, be fast, like test and learn, get into product, get out of product. Uh, that's what drives excitement. Yeah, and fall 2023 will be when they implement their plans that they set in fall of, you know, 2021, right? You know, then it's going to be two years behind. So, right, all right, well, exactly. speaking, speaking of moving quickly, uh, we're almost close to the end of our time, but I have some rapid fire questions I want to ask 
that are related right, to your tour. All right, you ready? All right. So I'm ready. first, what, in, just in general, what's the best thing you've seen? Uh, the best thing I've seen is just smiles on people's faces that work in retail. I mean, I, I, I have so many examples, but I will just say pride in retail. Great. Uh, what uh, state has the worst drivers? Florida. Florida. Okay. <laughs> He did not hesitate. Avoid Florida unless you're flying in. Uh, if you had to start your trip all over again, what else would you have packed? Oh, um, I would have packed. Um, so I'll, I love coffee. I've had coffee here when we left New York City. I'm like, we're going to find local coffee houses. <laughs> and um, so we we got rid of our Nespresso. Oh. Um, machine and we lasted about a month and then the first city <laughs> we were in that had an espresso store we went and bought it again so i would have kept an espresso maker got it great uh what's the number one thing that you miss about home uh you know new york city is so interesting because you have everything at your fingertips you know and i could Ex walk except out. cows except cows except let's cows. be honest yeah that's true yeah no cows um and the, the ease of access to everything I would need within yeah. a three block radius was really great. That's, I've been in, we've been camping places where the nearest Starbucks was 80 miles away. And so I think, you know, I want to, uh, that, that's a perk that I miss. Got it. I remember a solution provider, somebody asked, do you charge for drive time? He's like, it was a solution provider in Manhattan. He's like, my entire business is in like a 10 block radius. Like, of course not. It exactly. takes me a few minutes to walk there. Um, have you at any time, did you ever consider packing up and heading home early? Like, man, I've just been on the road too much. No, no, not at all. I've, I've enjoyed a couple of conferences I've attended or spoken at uh, with like a nice hotel room. Not going to lie, but to, <laughs> to give it up no. <laughs> Great. Uh, what's the most pleasant surprise on this trip? Uh, our national parks. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, least pleasant surprise. Um, gosh. So you're an optimistic person. This is a challenge. I, I really am. You. That is a really yeah. challenging question. Yeah. Um, oh. I, you know, I don't have one, Jim. All right. All right. Well, then like I'll ask a follow up to the most pleasant. Uh, what, like if you're going to say a national park, if you tell someone, mm -hmm. man, this is worth spending a few days, you know, driving, flying. What uh, is one or two of the national parks? Oh, Yellowstone National Park, for sure. Um, and I think the in the Rocky Mountains, too, like that. Um, it's really just incredible. You could spend a week just exploring, hiking. Um, it looks like a movie set. Like these places are just incredible. Uh, so I, I would highly recommend that. All right, last two questions. Uh, so uh, from a lightning round standpoint, so everyone's ordering from Amazon. Have you had an Amazon package delivered to your Airstream? Um, I do not. I've not ordered anything on, on online for six months because really? I don't have a physical address. No, no. <laughs> All right. You might be one, of the, one of the few people uh, in the United States doing that. So right. um, you know, there's a lot. Of, we didn't talk about sustainability or, you know, part of that mission. You know, yeah. how do you live small? How do you only have you know, a few pieces of clothes? How do you make all that work? Like that's a that's a whole other conversation, but not shopping online. All right. Well, I guess when you only have 180 square feet to live in, it's hard to order too much. Uh, when you're true. on the road, it better be a consumable. Uh, where have you seen the best sunrises or sunsets? Oh, easy. Angel Fire, New Mexico. I mean, that's it's named after its sunsets, you know, from the in indigenous people named it Angel Fire because the sky just is looks like fire. It's the, one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. Very cool. How long did you get to stay there? How many suns rises and sunsets? We were there for three three weeks because it okay. was so oh, beautiful. It's just north of Taos, and we loved it so much we extended our stay there. Good, yeah. It's a benefit you can do. You don't have to change any flights or anything. Exactly. Uh, and last question is: How can our audience follow you? How can they access the content that you're creating during this trip? Yeah, thanks, Jim. So I have a um, podcast called Retail in America, uh, which is 
uh, most all, every conversation has been recorded live here in person in the Airstream. It's turned into a mobile podcast studio, and I've had store managers, district managers, presidents, founders, CEOs, celebrities. I've had everyone, and uh, but with one core message, and that is their pride in retail and specifically brick and mortar. Um, so Retail in America on every podcast platform, retailpride.com. Um, also then list out the cities and the play. There's a playlist on Spotify for each city. Uh, there's a, sometimes there's some video content. Uh, everything you need is on retailpride.com and on Instagram at retailpride and on LinkedIn at Ron Thurston. Got it. Wonderful. And I'm making notes. We will include those links uh, on the on the page as well. Any final words for us before we wrap things up? Anything that you want to say, like as a going away before you continue uh, to hit the road? Any final thoughts you want to share with our audience? Yeah, as, I, as a tractor I, rolls by behind you. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm, just, you know, it's campground life. <laughs> um, I don't let the. Here's what I would say. Don't let the news headlines about all of the challenges in stores fool you. Go into a store, spend time speaking to the teams, ask questions, learn what they need, um, follow up with important solutions to their problems. But what you discover in stores, if you really dig into it, are people who love what they do. And that is, um, if you don't come from stores, you sometimes make an assumption that it's, it's all bad news because it's what you read. And it's just, um, there's, great stories in every city, in every mall, everywhere you go. There are incredible people who work in this business that I'm really proud to speak about, sometimes speak for, you know, that this is an, a really important part of our, of our economy and our, and our future um, as people join the workforce. And we need more people who speak in a very positive way about the frontline teams. So the more you can do that, uh, it helps every aspect of our business. Fabulous. And that is a great note for us to end on uh, today. So that does it for this episode of The Trusted Advisor. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. If you did, be sure to subscribe to the RSP YouTube channel and The Trusted Advisor podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you'd like to learn more best practices for VARs and ISVs in the retail technology industry, check out the RSP blog. You can find it at gorsp.org and then clicking on RSPA blog. Before we go, big thanks again to Ron Thurston for sharing his wisdom with us today. Thanks also to RSPA Marketing Director Chris Arnold for his production work, Joseph McDade for our music, and last but not least, thanks so much to you for listening. Our goal at the RSPA is to accelerate the success of our members in the retail technology ecosystem by providing knowledge and connections. For more information, visit our website at gorspa.org. Thanks for listening, and goodbye, everybody.